I'm going to read to you the words that are found in the book of the Acts of the Apostles in the second chapter, beginning at verse 37 and going on to the end of the chapter, to verse 47. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were, there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, I've read that entire paragraph to you because I'm anxious, uh, in a sense, to consider it with you in general tonight before we come to consideration of its particular statements. And those of you who attend here regularly will realize exactly what we are doing. We are studying this book of the Acts of the Apostles in order that we may have this only authoritative statement as to what the Christian church is as to what Christianity is, and as to what it really means to be a Christian. That's what we are doing. Uh, Here, I say, we have the only authoritative account. It's not a question of uh, opinion, this. Not what you and I think it ought to be. This is what it is. Here we are meeting in a Christian church. The question we should ask is, what is a Christian church? Is this some voluntary society or association of people? Is this something that has been started recently? What is it? And you find that it's something that goes back with all sorts of strange events and happenings and with strange vicissitudes away back to this book of the Acts of the Apostles. Here we have an account of how the whole thing came into being, how it began and what exactly it was. Now, why are we doing this? Well, we are doing this for one reason only, and that is because we know that this is the greatest need in the world at this present moment. Here is the only message that's being offered to men and women tonight which holds out any hope at all. Now, that's not a typical pulpit exaggeration. That's a sheer fact. If you want a proof of that statement, I simply tell you to read your daily newspapers and to read them thoroughly. And there you'll see that in spite of all our civilization and all our boasted advances, that the world is in desperate trouble. And we all know that in personal experience. We know that life is a battle. It's a problem. It's not something easy. And all these rose-colored spectacles that are offered to us, we know are the productions of the devil and of hell. It's not true. It's a false view of life. It's not real. So many believe that kind of thing and then are horribly disillusioned and are unhappy. Life is real, life is earnest. And it is a fight and a problem and a battle. And I say that we are considering these things because they hold out the only hope. It's the only message. It's called a gospel. It's good news. This is the very thing that men and women need. And the tragedy, I say, the supreme tragedy is that they don't know this and they don't know it so often 
because they've assumed that the church is something that she's not, and they've assumed that the Christian message is something that is about as far removed from the real thing as anything could possibly be. That's why in a day of confusion like this, when there is this terrible confusion as between the thoughts of men, what's called philosophy, and the revelation of God, Nothing is more urgently important than that we should go back and allow the records to speak to us and to find out what the church was like at the beginning and how she came into being. Now then, we've been doing this, and last Sunday night we were considering how it is that one becomes a Christian. And we saw that it's this process which we call conviction. It's the action of the Holy Spirit. Peter expounded scriptures it's what people would call a very dry sermon and just exposition of scriptures. And yet tremendous things happened. As he was speaking, people began to cry out saying, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What had happened to them? Well, as we saw, the Holy Spirit had brought the thing home to them. These were a part of the crowd that had a few weeks before had cried out concerning our Lord and Savior, away with him, crucify him. We're not interested. Give us Barabbas. They preferred a robber to the Savior of the world. But now it suddenly comes home to them that they'd made a disastrous mistake. They'd blundered. And they be began to see the consequences of that. So they become convicted of sin. This is how one becomes a Christian. Conviction of sin. A realization that you've been fighting against God, rejecting his most glorious offer, the most wonderful manifestation of his love. And you see the consequences, and you're alarmed, and you cry out unto God, and you're given the answer. Repent, acknowledge it, and confess it all, and be baptized in, which means that you believe in and utterly submit yourself to Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, you'll get forgiveness and pardon. And all that is promised, this great promise of the gift of the Holy Ghost and so on. Now then, that is the kind of process, that's the way in which one becomes a Christian. Not through being born in Great Britain, rather than in Japan, no, no. Not being born the child of a Christian family, no, no, that doesn't do it either. Not through living a good life. No, no. It's just this. That the Spirit of God in power comes and brings the truth home. Especially the truth about this person, Jesus of Nazareth. And you see what he means to you. You'd never thought of him before. He didn't count. He didn't matter. And you were ready to agree with people who some even said that he'd never lived. And even if it could be proved that he could be blotted out of history, it wouldn't make any difference to you. Now you see that all that is not only a tragic mistake, but that you're in a terrible predicament. And you need what God alone can give you. And you turn to him in utter, absolute submission, confession of your sin and failure and inability and a simple childlike belief of the message concerning our Lord and Savior. Now, what we're looking at tonight is what follows from that? What follows from that? Or if you like, in other words, what is a Christian? That's what happens to a man to make him a Christian. But what is a Christian? Well, here we are again given this authoritative account of this matter. And again, let me emphasize the vital importance of this record. Here is the first account of uh, the Christian church. God added to the church daily such as should be saved. We were told before that that on that occasion 3,000 souls were added unto them. You see there had been a little body of people. The apostles and about 120 people, they were gathered together in an upper room. There's the nucleus of the church, and the Spirit comes down upon them. There's your Christian church. Now, these men are added to them. Now, here is the church. Well, what sort of people were they? Well, here is the authoritative description of what a Christian's like, what it means to be a Christian. And again I say, surely this is the only authoritative statement on the subject. Oh, I know you can buy books today and you can read about men who are described as the greatest Christians of the 20th century and so on because they've done certain things. But that's, that's not authoritative. 
This is authoritative. And you judge those men, you judge everybody else. You judge yourself, I judge myself. Not by what I read about men today, but what I read about these men. Here are the first Christians. Here is the first gathered company of Christian people. And what I've got to test myself by is this. How do I measure up to this? Are there evidences in me of what I see so clearly here? And this is undoubtedly given to us for that reason that we may test and examine ourselves by it and be quite sure that we are Christians. Now, what does it mean to be a Christian? Very well. Let me answer, first of all, by putting it in the negative. You've got to do this. There is so much being poured out against all this that I am driven perforce to deal with that. It isn't that I want to do that or that I even like to do that. I don't. I wish I could be content with a positive exposition. But I live in the same world as you do and I try to keep my eyes open. It's my duty to do so. I can't help people unless I know their difficulties and problems. So I read the newspapers and I listen to the wireless and I look at the television when these things are being dealt with. And I know the kind of impression that is being given as to what it is that makes a man a Christian. Or let me put it quite simply like this. What would your answer be if I handed out a sheet of paper and a pencil to you? to everybody in this congregation and told you put down in as few words as you can your idea as to what it means to be a Christian. What is a Christian? Now then, I'm here to point out that as we look at this record, I think we'll all have to admit and to agree that it's very different indeed from what we've always assumed it to be. It's very different indeed from what it is described as being popularly today. It's entirely different. What is it? Well, this, these are the ideas, are they not? The idea is, the primary, that it's something you take up. You decide to be a Christian. You go in for it. You've tried various other things, the cults and so on. Try the church. Try Christianity. That's the popular attitude in general. Then uh, there are all sorts of divisions, of course, with regard to this. We haven't the time to go into them all, but let me give you some general headings to show what I mean. There are some people who quite clearly think that uh, what makes a man a Christian is that he's got an intellectual interest in certain problems. Purely intellectual approach and nothing else. They're serious men and they're able men and they are concerned about life and its problems. And they know that here is this traditional historic teaching and that therefore it's their bounden duty to consider it, and so they read about it and can become very interested in it, and they may accept a great deal of it, but it's all in the mind, it's all theoretical, and they may greatly enjoy this, it almost becomes their hobby, but it's nothing beyond that. And there are many men who give their whole lives to that, they're called scholars, and they just spend their time like this intellectually, dealing with these matters and writing their books one against another or in agreement with one another, and that's the whole of their life and occupation. But it's entirely something in the mind. And so, the man in the street often thinks today that Christianity, well, it's just a kind of mental, intellectual hobby which some people take up. Some take up music, some take up art and drama. Well, there are these odd people who take up Christianity this intellectual matter. And there it is, they said. I notice they say these men don't seem to agree with one another. They have violent disagreements. One man says it's this, the other man says it's that. Well, of course, if they're like that sort of thing, says the men in the street, all right, let them carry on. But as for me, not interested. Not interested at all. And he's not interested in Christianity because he thinks that that is what it is. So that's one of the false ideas. Then there are others who say, no, no. That isn't really, really the thing at all. They say, no, what makes a man a Christian is that he happens to be an emotional sort of person. It's purely a matter for the feelings. He says, I know some of them, and obviously it's purely a matter of emotionalism. They can't uh, argue seriously with you. They, can't, uh, they haven't read the books. They can't discuss them with you. They don't know, but they seem to have had some wonderful feelings. And they live on this, and they try to work it up again. And they're living always in this highly emotional atmosphere. 
deliberately worked up at times. It's, it's a purely emotional phenomenon. You've heard people expounding that on the television, haven't you? And of course, they've got a good deal of material that lends uh, considerable weight to what they're trying to tell us. There are people like that. But the question is, is that what you find here in this record in the second chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles? So some think it's purely emotional. And then there's the third group, which puts its entire emphasis upon the will. And according to these, what makes a man a Christian is not what he thinks. They say, let him think what he likes. It's not emotionalism. They say, well, if people like to play with emotions, let them do so. But as for me, says this man, my idea of Christianity is this, that it's what you do. It's the way in which you live. Are you living for the good of humanity? Are you ready to make sacrifices? Are you ready to put career after great career on one side and do something heroic and wonderful and sacrificial? That's what makes a man a Christian. It's a question of the will. A man deciding deliberately that he's going to set out to improve the lot of mankind. He's going to uplift the human race. He's going to work perhaps in politics or in social work or anything. It doesn't matter where, as long as he's giving himself in service. What's it matter what he believes? The intellectual is comparatively unimportant. Indeed, you can be certain of very few things in a world like this. The thing is, your will and your desire and what you're actually doing in the realm of practice. Now, I think you're all in agreement with me. You must be. These are the things that are commonly said. I'm putting before you these various views with, res with regard to what it is that makes a man a Christian. Shall I try and sum it up by putting it like this? Isn't this the common idea of, of being a Christian? Now, this is a common idea, let me say, amongst large numbers who've been even brought up as Christians. For what it's worth, I held this view of being a Christian for many a year. This was my idea of it that it's a, a task which you have to take up and which you take up more or less reluctantly. This is the idea of Christianity, something that you do in a spirit of fear, something that you do more or less in a miserable condition. The idea of Christianity is that it's mainly something that spoils life. You knew other people who hadn't been brought up as Christians, and you saw that they did things freely without any hesitation at all. And you wished that you could be doing the same, but you're afraid. You'd been brought up in a chapel or a church, as, brought up in a, as a Christian, as it were. And though you wanted to do that, you couldn't do it. This Christianity stood between you and that. Christianity, to the vast majority, seems to be something that rarely spoils life. Something negative something prohibitive, something restrictive, something which we are afraid not to do. There's no happiness anywhere near it. There's no joy. It's quite the reverse. It's a teaching that makes you, in the words of Milton, to scorn delights and live laborious days. You've got to go to the church meeting on Sunday. And the trouble is, it's so far it's been twice on Sunday. Well, let's try and get a reform movement to bring it once on Sunday and put that about nine o'clock so that you've dinner that you've got the rest of the day free. Now, that's the attitude. To, that's, that's the idea of Christianity. This is a task. This is something that you do because you're afraid not to do it. It's a task that's imposed, and you take it up because you're afraid not to. But it's solemn, and it's unhappy, and it's miserable. And the whole time, the whole thing is... Quite uncertain, and you don't quite know what you're doing. You're only hoping that somehow or another you are doing the right thing and that it's going to bring you to the right place in the end. But the whole thing is vague and uncertain and indefinite. But what characterizes it above everything else is that it's a duty, a task, a solemn duty, which you've got to do and go through. The sooner the better it's finished and the shorter the service, the better. Isn't that the common idea of Christianity? Well, my dear friends, we've got to face these things. You see, only 10% of the people of this country even claim to be Christian. And I wonder what percentage of them hold that particular view of it that I've just been putting before you. I'm afraid it's alarming to contemplate the number. Christianity as a solemn task which makes us more or less miserable 
and stands between us and what appears to be a life of freedom and abandon and enjoyment. Now, that's the impression of Christianity. So, it happens, you see, and we know this process so well because most of us have been through it. Starting out with that idea, and of course it's encouraged by parents compelling their children to go to Sunday school, sending them there to get rid of them, and they were made to go. It it results in this, that when the adolescent comes along, he says, no more of that. I'm going to shake myself free from all this. I want my liberty. Christianity is a chain. It's a fetter. It's a load. John Bunyan had got it, a man carrying a pack on his back. And they stop Pilgrim's Progress at that point, you see. The burden, the misery, the unhappiness. That's the notion of Christianity. So people turn their backs upon it, and they're not interested in it. Now then, I read those 11 verses to you just now in order that you might see what an utter travesty that is of Christianity. A complete travesty. Listen. Here it is, they continue daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. What a contrast. Could anything be a greater contrast? But this is Christianity. How little of it there is. That's why the world is in our present trouble. We've got to get back to true Christianity, my friends. I'm not interested in traditions. I'm not interested in what may be thought. I'm only concerned to get back to this. This is the real truth, the real thing. And it's not only true of these early times. You read the great epochs and eras in the history of the church, times of reformation and revival, and what you'll always find is that it's a repetition of this. Same thing. These are the marks and the characteristics of a man who is truly Christian. These are the marks and characteristics of a a gathering of Christians, the church, if you like, the Christian church, as she's meant to be. Oh, how different from what she's become. But this is the thing that matters, and I'm not here to advocate anything else at all. Very well, there it is put in the negative side, the contrast which now I'm going to to draw out to you and with you. What is it? What is this? Which is so different. Well, I must remind you again that it is primarily something that happens to us. We've got to go on saying this. You cannot make yourself a Christian. Something that happens to us. The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far, are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, this call of God, this thing that comes to us through the word of God applied by the Holy Spirit, and you hear a call, and you respond saying, I hear thy gentle voice that calls me, Lord, to thee for cleansing in the precious blood that flowed on Calvary. You hear a call. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The call comes in a variety of ways. Oh, you may hear it as a kind of command. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then you notice this interesting term. Uh, The Lord added to the church daily, I'm reading the authorized version, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. But everybody's agreed that that's a very bad translation. Unfortunately, it should read, the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. They were being saved. And they were added to the church. Now, you see, we're in a realm here which is all so different from all that I've been describing to you. All that is controlled by man. And man, of course, can be religious. You can decide to be religious, and you can live the religious life. But that's got nothing to do with Christianity. Nothing at all. That is dead, it is lifeless, it is mechanical, it is dull, it is filled with fear, it's a terrible, horrible task. This 
is instinct with life and power and abandon and everything that is so essentially different. And it's all because of this. It is the action of God. It is the work of the Holy Spirit of God sent into the church in order that this kind of thing might take place. Oh, I've often quoted it before. Wordsworth wasn't thinking of the thing that I'm talking about, but it's such a wonderful expression. I always like it. He was thinking of nature, but this is what happens to a man who becomes a Christian. He comes to a point when he's able to say, for I have felt a presence that disturbs me. A presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thought. And no man is a Christian unless he's been aware of this presence that disturbs him. Something happening. The great almighty God who made us at the beginning, remaking us, doing something in us and upon us, making something of us. And what he does, of course, is to produce a complete change. Now, we looked at that in one sense last Sunday night. I'm looking at it in another sense this evening. And what I want to show you tonight is that he doesn't merely produce a change in us with respect to our views of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the thing last Sunday night that stood out. They saw their tragic mistake. But oh, it does much more than that. What happens to a man when he becomes a Christian is this, that his whole position is changed. His whole condition is changed. He's moved from one position to another. The Bible's full of this. The Apostle Paul reminds the Colossians that they have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. There is a total moving of a man from one position into another position. Now, the way in which that is put here is this. This word saved is being used here. And it's a most important word. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. The Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. What does this mean? Well, you see the the picture that is involved in that word saved. Well, I know many people react violently against this word. They hate it. And I think I know why they hate it. We don't get as much of it as it used to be, but I remember very well, particularly when I was a young man, I resented it, I disliked it, and my contemporaries were almost unanimous in rejecting it with me. There was no kind of person that we so hated and abominated as the man who came up to you and said, Are you saved? He said it so glibly. And often he didn't fully know what he was saying. People have reacted against it because of its glib use. I'm not here to defend that, but this is a tremendous word. Here it is before us. And it is vital that we should know what it means. The difference, in other words, between a Christian and a non-Christian is that the Christian is amongst the saved. The non-Christian is amongst those who are not saved. It's like this, if you like. Imagine a house on fire and a number of people inside it. And a ladder is put up. A certain number are rescued. They're saved. The rest are burnt in the fire. What a difference. The saved, the lost. Or think of it in terms of a shipwreck. Think of any illustration you like. These are the the thoughts and the pictures that are behind the New Testament use of this particular term. Or another one is a judgment or a court. And a charge being brought. And a man is in one of two positions at the end of the trial. He is either at liberty or else he's under condemnation, sent to prison and to punishment. Say, my dear, these are the great words. Then another one in the New Testament is, of course, the position of a slave. A slave hasn't free will. He's entirely under the control and the domination of his owner. But he can be bought out. He can be set at liberty. He can be emancipated. He becomes a free man. That's the difference between the lost and the saved. Now, says somebody, but that's what I object to. This term saved, you people are claiming as Christians that you are perfect. No, no, we are claiming nothing of the sort. Even in this one paragraph that we have before us tonight, it's quite clear that there are tenses to this word saved. Different tenses. So that you can say of the Christian that he has been saved. You can say of the Christian that he is being saved. 
And you can say of the Christian that he's going to be saved. Now, I read to you that portion, that first chapter of the first epistle of Peter, because in that chapter you get uh, these very tenses brought out uh, very clearly. The apostle, the same person, you see, the apostle Peter, writing his letter later on in life, he puts it like this in the seventh verse. He says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not yet believing ye rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. And yet, you see, he's already been referring to them as people who've already undergone salvation. And he's perfectly right. Look at it like this. The first thing we have to realize about ourselves is that we are in a terribly dangerous position. Now, this is a position. This is a status. This is a standing. This is a condition, if you like. What is this? Well, it is that we are all face to face with God. Oh, let me take up one of those illustrations again. Look at that man standing there in a dock in a court. There are many things to be said about that man. But the most important and the first thing we say about him is that he's a man in a dock. He's on trial. He's before a judge. Now that man may be feeling well or he may be feeling ill. That's got nothing to do with his position. He may have slept well the night before, he may not have slept a wink. It doesn't make any difference at all. His position is that he's on trial and he's facing a judge and there's a charge brought against him. And there are terrible possibilities. That's his position. And that's the way in which we've got to look at this question of salvation in the first instance. You can divide men and women, if you like, into good and bad. People do that, don't they? It's quite meaningless because what we are concerned about is the position. And the teaching of the Bible is to the effect that all mankind, whether we call them good or bad or, or anything else you may like to call them, the point is we are all in the dark. And the judgment of God is upon us. We are none of us righteous by birth. We are all under condemnation. That's our status. Or if you like, we're all in a world on fire. We're all in danger of eternal destruction. Lost. That's our position. Now, the teaching is that the moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, your whole position is changed. Your standing and status under God is entirely removed and different. That's the first way in which you look at salvation. And it is in that sense that you can say of a Christian that he is already saved. What that means is, to use the language of the Apostle Paul, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. We are all in the dark by birth and by actions. We've all sinned against God. The law of God is the prosecuting counsel and the just and the holy God is sitting there on the bench and we're every one of us guilty and the sentence on a guilty sinner is everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Lost. But according to this teaching, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth in him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We are all under condemnation until we believe. The moment we believe, we are no longer under condemnation. We are saved from the condemnation of the law. We are no longer in the dark. We are set at liberty. We are introduced into the kingdom of God and the glorious liberty of the children of God. So a Christian is bound to say in that sense, I am saved. Because the Son of God, Jesus Christ, 
has taken my guilt and my sins upon himself and has stood in my place, has received my condemnation, has received my punishment. I am absolved. I am free. The terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. I am saved once and forever from the condemnation of God's holy law because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. No condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. But that doesn't mean that I'm perfect. No, no. Having been changed in my whole status and standing and position, the process now begins in me. What's this? Well, I need to be saved. Saved from what? Saved from my evil nature. Saved from my evil tendencies. Saved from the relics and the remnants of sin that remain in my mortal body. I am being saved. That's what's called in the Bible sanctification. The first is called justification. This is called sanctification. The Christian is not perfect, but he's gradually, slowly being made perfect. There may be lots and ups and downs about it, but he is slowly being prepared for the glory to which he's going. He has been saved. He is being saved. And the day will come when he shall have been saved completely and perfectly. The Bible calls that glorification. When a man shall be free not only from the condemnation of the law and the guilt of his sin, he shall be entirely delivered from the power of sin and from the pollution of sin. He shall be sinless. He will be perfect. Not in this world. That's in the glory in the world that is to come. So there are tenses to this word salvation. I have been saved. I am being saved. I shall be saved. And you'll find these three tenses constantly in the New Testament writings. Very well. What I'm establishing, you see, is this. That this is what makes a man a Christian. There's a tremendous movement taking place. Here are these men. They went to listen to Peter that morning in the dock. They didn't know it. They didn't realize it. Peter's words under the Holy Spirit brought it home to them. And they were convicted and they saw it and they cried out. The answer came and out they go from the dock. They're saved. Their whole position is changed. They've been translated from one kingdom into another. All right, that's the first thing. But the second thing we notice about these people is this. And how, how important this is. This Christianity of theirs is something that is central in their lives. And this is true of every Christian. Christianity becomes central in the life of a man who is a true Christian. And this is where you see the contrast with that popular view of Christianity that I've already tried to dismiss. I'm still dismissing it. What's that? Well, that is, of course, something that we add to our lives. The main tenor of our lives is very much the same as that of everybody else in the world. But we've got one difference. Sunday morning, we go to a place of worship for a brief service. The other people don't. That's the only difference between us. Now, am I being unfair? Am I exaggerating? God knows I'm not. Look at the general tenor of the life. Look at the interests. Look at the things that excite them. Look at the things they're out for. They're exactly the same as everybody else. There's only this one difference, that they do this odd thing at a given time once a week. Perhaps not even that. Sometimes only once a year. But they're called Christians because they do it once a year. It's not at the center of their lives. It's an addition to their lives. I've often compared it to a man taking up a bag He's got a number of bags, but there's one he only takes up on Sunday morning, and then he goes to a place of worship. Then having been there, he puts it down as quickly as he can. Back he goes to live as he was living before and as everybody else lives. Just this a bag that he picks up and puts down, or a, or a cloak, if you like, that he puts on, and on these odd occasions puts it off again. Oh, this is, this is not Christianity. It's got nothing to do with it. This was the life of these people. It was the center. It was the controlling factor. It was everything to them, and it always is to the true Christian. Or if you like, let me put it like this. 
Christianity is not something peripheral to one's life. It is always at the center. But the false idea of it always has it on the periphery. It isn't the heart, it isn't the vital thing, it isn't the controlling thing. But it's, it's got its place there on the periphery of life. Generally as far away as it can be from the center, but it's got to be there because they're afraid not to have it there. They live as near as they can to the world and still like to feel they don't ultimately belong to it. That's what I mean by having it on the periphery. But that's not Christianity. The thing that hits you about these people is that their whole life was changed, their whole outlook was changed. Their life is now controlled by something absolutely new. These people, look at them. They were the mob, part of the crowd of Jerusalem. They had not been followers of Jesus Christ like these disciples. In fact, they're the people, I say, who cried out, saying, Away with him, crucify him. That's where they belong, but they no longer belong. They now belong to these disciples, the followers of this Jesus, this Galilean. Why, well, isn't it obvious that they've become entirely different people? Their whole life is being controlled by something that wasn't there before. It's not an outward change. It's an inward change. It's a radical change. It's a very profound change. They're so changed, in fact, that now they are ready to take any risk in order to be with these people, the ones whom they revolved before. Now, they knew it was a dangerous thing to belong to these people. Hadn't their very leader been crucified on a tree but a few weeks back? And yet now they're ready to join these people, and they continue with them. They continue steadfastly with them. They wouldn't leave them. They're risking everything. They knew that their relatives would be annoyed, that probably they'd be ostracized by all who were dear to them and all their friends. It doesn't matter. They've submitted to public baptism. They've aligned themselves with these despised people, and they don't care what happens. They must be with them. That's Christianity. Not this miserable, doubtful, uncertain, unhappy something that you take on as a task and try to hide it as best you can in, in case they'll make a joke of you in the office tomorrow morning and say, Ah, oh, in chapel last night, were you? And oh, well, funny this is, this is. And you try to hide the fact that you've been to chapel, and to, but, but you still do it, of course, because you're afraid if you don't do it, what may happen to you? Or you promised your parents, Oh, my dear friends, that's an entirely different realm. Here there's an absolute change. This is everything. It's at the center. It's all important. And let me emphasize this next thing. In order that we may give the lie to this entirely erroneous conception of what it is to be a Christian. Nothing is so obvious about these people here as the fact that the whole man is involved. And there is nothing that should be more emphasized than just this. You know, I put it to you that some say it's mind only, others heart only, others will only. Oh, the glory of this Christian truth is that it takes up the whole men. It's so big, it's so great, it's so glorious. The entire man is emancipated and captivated and taken hold of by it. The whole personality is engaged. How do I see that? Well, look at the words that are used here. Look at the minds of these men. I read this, and uh, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. They believed it. They received it with their minds. Then I read later on in verse 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common. They believed. Well, what did they believe? Do you think it's possible that they didn't know what they believed? Do you think it's possible to say of these people as they're here described? No, no, they, they, they didn't know what they believed at all. And if you'd asked them what they believed, they couldn't say anything but that, well, uh, I was always brought up to do this, you know, and uh, I think it's quite good, and I think it may help the morals of the country if we hold on to these great traditions. We mustn't let them go, you know, things are very bad. Let's hold on. But uh, what is it? Well, they don't know what it is. But, my dear friends, this is the exact opposite. They that believed, and they all believed the same thing. I'm going to show you that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching doctrine. It comes to the mind. 
A Christian is a man who can tell you why he is a Christian. And if you cannot tell me why you're a Christian, I say you're not a Christian. If you can't give me a reason, if you can't say, I believe this and that, if you can't do that, you're not a Christian. They that believe, they that gladly receive the word that was spoken. The mind is engaged. Oh, I needn't repeat this, surely. I emphasized last Sunday night that the first thing that happens to a man, even under conviction, is that he is made to think for the first time in his life, truly and rarely, about the great question of life, death, and eternity. And these people, they know what they believe. They believe about this person, Jesus of Nazareth. As to who he is and what he's done and what it means to them, the mind is engaged and involved. And on they go to receive more and more of it. And it's thrilling and it's moving. And the mind expands. There's nothing that I know in the universe that is comparable to this gospel. I've often put it in this form. Is there somebody here with a superfluity of intellect? Are you such a great intellectual that you want some exercise for your great mind? Well, I can tell you what to do. Start studying the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. And when you finish that, if you do ever finish it, I can give you other writings of his to go on to. For profundity of thought, for amazing conceptions, for vistas of truth spreading out and out and out, even into eternity itself and the glory everlasting. Here is the thing that throughout the running centuries has expanded the greatest minds and intellects that the world has ever known. I'm reminded of the story of that old professor in Scotland last century when this modern intellectualism and scientism began to come in as a flood. He used to preface his lectures with these words. Gentlemen, I suggest to you that a gospel and a teaching that were good enough and great enough for a mind of a Paul and an Augustine and an Aquinas and a Luther and a Calvin and a Knox and a Pascal and a Wesley and a Gladstone are at least worthy of your respectful consideration. I hear people saying, I can't understand this. And they reject Christianity because their minds stumble at some particular thing. My dear friend, do you imagine for a moment that you were the first ever to have seen that problem? All your problems have been known to these great intellects throughout the centuries. Most of them, indeed, I would say all of them, are dealt with somewhere or another in the Bible. There's nothing original in your difficulty, but just look at it like this. Before you reject Christianity because of that, say, how did these men, with their giant idyllics, how did they receive it? That's the answer. It's no use saying modern knowledge has added it hasn't. It's made no difference. Modern knowledge has told us nothing new about God. It's told us nothing new about man. It's told us nothing new about death. It's told us nothing new about eternity. Here I say is something that comes to a man's mind. And he believes the truth. He receives the word that is preached. His whole intellect is engaged. And it begins to function as never before. But it isn't only his mind. Christians are not mere dry as dust intellectualists or academicians. The heart is involved. They that gladly received the word. Listen to it at the end. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. You know, this is true happiness. There is no real happiness apart from this. This idea that Christianity is something that makes a man miserable and wretched, it's the greatest lie that the devil has ever perpetrated. And that's how he deludes people. Ah, oh, they say, you become religious. You'll become miserable, you'll have to stop doing this and that, and you'll have to do these other things, and they're dull and boring, it's going to ruin your life, you're going to be miserable and unhappy as long as you live. Come with us, they say, come to the world and have life and enjoyment and happiness. Has there ever been a greater lie? Happiness in the world. 
Well, where is it, my friends? Have they got it? As I read their records and see them passing in kind of serials through this divorce court and its proceedings, I don't detect much happiness there. And as I see them having to drink and drink even isn't enough, they're turning to drugs now. And all the pleasures are not enough. They're getting worse and worse. Why? Well, because they're so utterly miserable. And there's only one thing in this world tonight that can make people really happy and filled with joy and gladness. It's the thing these people believed. But it wasn't merely in their minds. They were moved, they were happy, they were released, they were joyful. You know, this spirit that the Christian believes, it's a spirit that's characterized by certain fruit, and here it is, love, then joy and peace. The very things the world stands so much in need of tonight, of which it knows so little. But here, they've got it. I say in the face of persecution and possible death, these people were thrilling with happiness and with joy. And so have true Christians in all eras and periods ever since right down to this very night. Can a man who thinks be truly happy in a world of bombs and sin and shame? No, he can't. There's only one way of happiness, and that is to be separated from it into this other life in which you see through it and beyond it and know the glory that is coming. You can say then with the Apostle Peter, for the time being you're in somewhat of a heaviness, if needs be for the perfecting of your faith. Or you say with Paul, in this tabernacle we do groan being burdened, Yes, but earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from him. Gladness, joy, you realize you've escaped hell. You're no longer going to perdition. You're a child of God, and this glory is awaiting. Your heart is moved. You're living a great and a glorious and a big life, and you're rejoicing in it. Did you notice those words of Peter, whom having not seen ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not yet believing, you rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's it. The heart is engaged and, of course, the will. They were baptized, and I like these words. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and they continuing daily with one accord. It wasn't a flash in the pan. It wasn't just coming forward at the end of an emotional meeting and taking a decision or signing a card. I don't do that sort of thing because I know this is the work of the Spirit. And when the Spirit does it, it isn't just being carried away on the wave of a temporary passing emotion. No, no, the whole man is involved. The mind understands and knows what it's doing. The heart is moved and has its reasons that can't be expressed through thought. And the will becomes operative. And they are steadfast and they are reliable. And they continue. And on and on and on they go. That's Christianity. You see, it means this. That we have been separated from this present evil world and separated into and unto the kingdom of God and of his Christ. Are you a Christian? I'm not asking you, are you doing a lot of good? I'm asking you, are you a Christian? I'm not even asking you, are you a church member? I'm not asking you, were your parents Christian? I'm not asking you were you born in this country. I'm not asking you whether you were christened as a baby or even baptized as an adult. I'm not asking you any one of these questions. I'm simply asking this. Are you like the people described in this paragraph at the end of the second chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles? Have you received the truth? Are you a believer in these things? Have you received them gladly? And have they changed your total position? Do you know that you were forgiven? Have you lost the fear of death and the grave and the judgment of God? That's what it means. These men knew it. That's why they were so happy. And that's why they were ready even to die for this. Many of them had to die for it. As Christians have had to die since 
and throughout the centuries. And once a man sees this, he knows that he's saved once and forever from the condemnation of the law. Whatever happens to him, his position with God is right. God has forgiven him. His sins have been remitted. He is justified by God through his faith. God declares him to be free, and he knows that. His mind has seen the truth. He has received it. He has done it gladly, and he rejoices in it. And he gives practical demonstration of it. By leaving the world to which he belonged, and joining, being added to, the church, which consists of these people, who've got an entirely new view of life, New view of themselves, new view of the meaning of life, new view of the meaning of history and why things as they are, new view of death, new view of eternity, new view of God, new view of Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God and the Savior of their souls. Oh, it's entirely new. The man's controlled by this. It's at the center. Everything he does now comes to the bar of this. This is the determining factor. The whole of his life radiates out from this. It determines everything. Changes a man's view of marriage. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It even comes between a man and his nearest and dearest. I'm hoping to deal with it. But this is Christianity. It is the center. It comes before everything. It determines everything. It controls everything. It's something that takes a man's mind, his heart, his will, the whole personality. It makes an utterly new man of him. He is indeed born again, and he is a child of God. Are you a Christian? That's what a Christian is. And you become such by realizing that you're not a Christian, confessing it to God, and believing this truth concerning his Son, Jesus of Nazareth, and especially him dying crucified on a tree and rising again, seated at the right hand of God, and coming to wind up the affairs of this world, to destroy and banish sin and evil, and to set up his everlasting kingdom of glory. Repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.